guess the official start was probably the summer of 2005. Uh, we had our first summer camp, which was successful. You know, kids wrote really, really simple games. And over the next three years, I tried to adapt the curriculum so it could be taught at other places besides the summer camp. We're running an after-school program in five different states. We have hundreds of kids a year who go through it. And the volunteers are all computer science majors and professional programmers. Uh, so the kids who come to us uh, have never programmed before. And in Boston, if you're 12, not only have you never programmed before, you've never seen the Pythagorean theorem. At certain schools, they've barely seen coordinates, so it's starting pretty much from scratch. How do we get them from there to programming? Um, we start off just teaching them how to write simple expressions and scheme. So no, no programs, no functions, just here's how to draw a circle, here's how to add two numbers, here, things like that. So then we go to functions, um, and we say, okay, you know, can you, can you generalize the stuff that you already learned about, let's say, how to draw a green circle of radius 10? And then we link those functions together to have a simple animation. So from there we had them write the easiest game in the world. They have a little cowboy who's running across a canyon, and if he you know, falls in, in between two coordinates, then the game is over. Really simple game. And eventually the kids start to say, well, what if we wanted to have a buffalo running in the opposite direction? And we say, well, to do that, you, you, you can't just have one number. You would need a number for the cowboy and a different number for the buffalo. So this motivates the discussion on data structures. We eventually make the game more and more advanced until they've got a buffalo and a cowboy and they're moving in different directions and they just do all this data modeling to come up with their data structure. We're doing conditional branching with structures and all of that. And the games they're building are actually really sophisticated. Alright, so raise your hand if you, uh, if you like to play video games. Raise your hand if you're interested in making a video game. Okay, good. I'm glad you all raised your hand because that's what we're here to do. The stuff we're learning, by the way, is not programming for students. This is not a youth or kitty programming class. This is a programming class. We brought you here to this college because you're going to be learning the same material college students learn. So the stuff you're going to be doing this week is stuff that 19-year-olds do, 18-year-olds do, and it's hard for them. So it's going to be hard for you too, and that's okay. So, a lot of you, when you walked in, you saw that I had written open Chrome up here, username, PC lab, password guest, and you just knew to log in. How come when you walked in, you looked at this and you just knew what to do? Because you're smart. That's one reason. But also because you're human. And humans are really good at figuring out confusing, ambiguous stuff. For example, can uh, I have you come up here and draw a square on the board for me? Did you do it right? What do you think? This was genius. She knew to draw a square. Did I tell her what color? Did I tell her how big to make it? Did I even tell her to draw it on the board? Why am I so impressed by this? A computer wouldn't have been able to figure that out. So uh, Roderick is gonna pretend to be a computer. Give him as precise instructions as possible because he needs to be told every last little step. Draw two parallel lines and another two connecting to them. More specific than, uh, than that. Uncap the marker. Which marker? Oh, black marker, put it on the board. <laughs> uh, all right, some, someone else, someone else. Vertical, then horizontal. Ver uh. Okay, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and then a vertical line going up, and then a horizontal. Stop. <laughs> is, it, is it as good as her square? No, she was way better. What is the moral of the story? Yeah, you gotta be exact. You can't have any ambiguity. If something can't be absolutely clear what it's meant to do, the computer's gonna freak out. I wanna get us started with how to write very simple programs in Wii Scheme. We just were talking about how computers are really stupid. And they don't understand normal things like we do, unless you put it in a special syntax. So, whenever you see a circle of evaluation, you can always start out with a brace, Top, left, right, and close it up, like a circle. Let's see who can get this. Start at the outside and work your way in. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. That's right, so he puts the function first. Another parenthesis, how come a parenthesis? Yeah, because he's got to close the circle, he's got to finish everything there. Excellent. But he goes to the left, he sees a three. Then he goes to the right and he sees a, another circle. Yes, a parenthesis, good. Then we close the circle, and how do we do that? Parenthesis, yes, beautiful. Thank you. And to draw the circle of evaluation, once you're done with that, you're going to convert it to scheme code. Questions? For me, when I get stuck, when I see something that I can't figure out, I like to break it up into smaller chunks. So I look at this thing, and I'm thinking, okay, let me start with the 1 plus 2. I know how to make a circle for 1 plus 2. 
I know how to make the circle for 3 times 7. So I've broken the problem down into smaller bits. Now all I have to figure out is, how do I subtract these circles from each other? Any ideas? Your answer. Yep, the function at the top, minus sign. So if you find yourself getting stuck, just break the problem down into smaller bits. So when I'm converting a circle to scheme code, I start at the outside and I work my way in. And I always go top, left, right. So, I see a circle. Mara, what's the first thing I write? Open parentheses. Then where do I go? I see, I go to top. Then where do I go? Left. And what do I see on the left? I see a circle. So now I see a circle, so I've got to start fresh with that. What's the first thing I write when I start a circle? Parentheses. Parentheses, good. And, and now I'm inside a circle. Where's the first place I go? Up. The top. And I see a? Star. Good. Very good. The reason that I thought learning Scheme was a really cool thing and why it's a great language is that unlike a lot of other computer languages, it's what's called a functional programming language. And functional programming languages behave the same way math does. My belief is if the kids are learning a language that is pure algebra at age 12, then by the time they get to high school, when they start learning real algebra, that this will actually give them a boost uh, later on. And we're also hoping that they'll get excited about programming and they'll feel like they can be programmers because right now, they are. It's true that math is boring. No, it's not. I know. I'm just teasing. But you guys didn't come here to play with numbers. You came here to mess around with more than numbers. You came here to mess around with words and pictures and stuff like that. And Scheme has a lot more for us than just numbers. In Scheme, when you're thinking about functions, you think of them sort of like blueprints that tell you how to use them. So I'm just going to give you an example of a blueprint for plus. This blueprint says that plus takes in a number and another number. You give plus two numbers and it promises to give you back what? The answer. And what is that answer? Is it a cow? A cow. A muffin? A cow. What is it? It's a pie. A number. It gives you back a number. These things that we've written up here are called contracts. Every contract has three parts. It's got the name of the function. So here it is plus, here it is minus. It's got a domain, that's the stuff you got to give to it to make it work. And then it's got the range, the stuff that it gives you back. In a minute, I'm going to show you contracts for other functions that let you work with pictures. Ooh, string image. So the nice thing about contracts is in, in the real world, if I hire somebody to like fix my basement, and then I come downstairs and I realize that, that they've just, yeah, it's all leaky, I can sue them because they broke the contract. I promised I'd give them money and they'd fix my basement, but instead I give them money and... It's flooded. It's disgusting, yeah. So, if you break a contract, something bad can happen. And in, in Scheme, it's the same deal. So, how many of you have heard of things like viruses or computers getting hacked? A very common type of hack involves giving a computer, giving a function, an input that it wasn't expecting. For example, somebody has a function that takes in your credit card number, but instead you give it something that's not a credit card number, that's like computer code that executes and does something bad. That's what's called breaking the contract. And if the programmer who wrote that banking software didn't check their contracts carefully, then they can get hacked. Because someone might be able to give them a different domain than they were expecting. So contracts are really important. Try typing it in, and I want to know what this thing does. What the heck does string length do? Convert it to scheme code. If you see what? Yeah, I knew it would No, why not? Let's try plus one two. Check it out. When I change the spaces, I got a different answer back. You have lots of spaces everywhere. Here you go. Raise your hand if you can tell me the name of the function we just did. String length. String length, very good. What was the domain of string length? What, raise your hand if you can tell me what you have to give to string length. Jakai. A string? A string, yes. What's the range of string length? Raise your hand if you can tell me what it promises to give you back. A number, exactly. So string length says, you give me a string, I promise I'll give you back a number, and if not, you can sue. I can give you another string function, or I can start showing you image functions. What do you want? Images? Good. The bottom window that you've been using is called the interactions window. The top window is called Definition. definitions. This is where you can write stuff that you'll keep. If I write 
plus one, two up here, it's going to run that code and give me three at the bottom. The nice thing about the definitions window is that it allows me to do stuff like this. Define age 16. What am I going to get back if in the interactions window down at the bottom I type age? Define your age to be whatever age you actually are, and then click run and tell me what happens. By the time we come back from lunch, you guys are going to be able to make flags just like this. That was awesome! Do you think I can make a flag with my own symbol on it? You guys will be making your very own flags after lunch. Oh! So you're telling it, you're saying, Rect is an invisible, empty canvas. And we can put things on the canvas. And then you can start building flags. What if I wanted to make the flag of Japan? What would I need to put on my scene? A circle. A circle. Red circle. And we know it's red. Is it solid or outline? Solid. Solid. Here's the new piece. We're going to place an image of a rectangle on top of our rect. Great. The flag of Somalia is a five-pointed star. So now I'm placing a star on top of the result of placing a rectangle on top of my empty scene. Where does the star go in the Somali flag? We need to give it an X and a Y coordinate. In the center. In the center. We know how big our scene is, so what are the coordinates at the dead center? 200 and 125. There you go. Beautiful. The scheme doesn't have sideways triangles, does it? No. So, so how, how did we, you do that? We uh, used a spike, a three-pointed star, star to get the triangle. We made the coordinates, like, negative, okay. so that the triangle is basically half over there. Yeah. Oh! Yeah. Yeah. We made the Puerto Rican flag. They got it. Pretty amazing flags that I've seen here. Vietnamese flags, these guys have some, some anime images. These oh, flags look idea. awesome. Now, flags are really just a fancy way of saying a picture that doesn't move. A flag could be any size, you could have anything on it. And really, we're just talking about pictures. So congrats, you've learned how to put images together to create a single image. That's really important for when you're making your game. What we really need are things that can make the images change from moment to moment. Just think, by the way, that at 9 o'clock this morning when you came in, you all started with that. That's where you started, 9 a.m., and now you're making flags. Just the same way that we're, doing, that we're going to work with animation, we're going to start simple and then make things actually animated. My goal is that by 4 o'clock, you're going to have a simple animation of something flying around the screen. I've written down a really simple function. This is something you've never seen before. Rather than defining like age to be 16, or defining food to be pizza, those were just values, right? If I define food to be pizza, then food is what? Pizza. Pizza. And if I type food in again, it's pizza. And if I type it in again, it's pizza. Right? So it's just not, it's not moving. It's static. It's always pizza. Just like these flags are not moving. Now I'm defining something that can change. I'm making a function called double. So I write define and then open parentheses, double x. And what it does to x is it multiplies it by 2. Since it's a new function that doesn't exist until I just wrote it, I also have to give it a purpose statement, something that tells human beings what the heck this thing does. What computers care about is the code. The header tells you what the name of the function is and what you're going to call all the little inputs in its domain. The body tells you what to do with those inputs. What if instead of X, I change this to the letter N? Will this code work? No. Yes. yes. No. Who says yes? Yeah, me. Okay, why? I think it's still a variable. It is still a variable, okay. Monitor's on, try it out. Go line by line, think through each thing, what needs to change. The next challenge is almost the same. It's almost the same. We're just going to change a tiny little thing. Tiny, big thing. Before, we asked you to draw, make a function green circle. So it took in numbers and drew differently sized green circles. Then we asked you to make a blue triangle. It took in a number, drew differently sized blue triangles. Before, you had to write these giant lines of code to draw it. What you could do now is make a function that has all the code already in it, and so somebody else could take it and just write Puerto Rican flag, 
green. And all of a sudden, that star is green. So that's the whole purpose of functions, so that you can write stuff that makes life easier for you later or for other people. So suppose you have a rocket traveling at 7 meters per second. How high is the rocket after 1 second? 7 meters. What about after 2 seconds? How high is the rocket? 14, and that's the key. The only thing changing is time. So, suppose you wanted to write a function called rocket height. Every contract has three parts. Me. The name. What's the name of the function? Rocket. Rocket. Height. Height. Oh. What's the domain? We're taking in. We're taking in time, right? Zero, one, two. What is that? Number. Number. Good. It takes in a number, and it's giving us back the height. What are these things? Right. You can call it out. Number. All right. We've got the contract already. Great. Now it's time for the code. How do I start writing a function? Define. Define. Then what? What else goes in the function header? Rocket height. How do I know that's the name of my function? Name. It's in the contract. If you get the contract right, it gives you everything. Now comes the easy part. Writing the code. This just says, rocket height takes in the time, multiplies time by seven. And once you have it working and tested, you're actually going to be able to see a rocket fly. What do functions have to do with animation? You just made this rocket height function. You want to use that to animate something. Here's how it works. A running program is a world of data. Sometimes it changes when you do something to it. You click the mouse, you hit a key, and the world changes. I'd like one brave volunteer to come up here. For what? It's not brave if you know what you're getting into. <laughs> and the way it's going to work is every Five seconds, he's going to go, bang. Bang. <laughs> Nothing's happening, right? For now, our world is just going to be a number. And it's going to start at zero. For now, okay? Try again. It's kind of boring. I would like another volunteer. He's going to be update world. Oliver, this is you. This code is you, because you're update world. My world starts at zero. Every time Bunnell goes, bang. We're going to update the world. Thank you. Our world is changing right now. And it starts out real simple. All that's happening is a number is getting bigger, 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 bigger each time. You're going to write a function called update world. Update world takes in a number and gives you back a number. Which it all does is add 10 to something. Everything up here right now is exactly what Bonnell and Oliver were doing. Bonnell is now going to say, not just every five seconds, you know, tick, tick, tick. He's also going to go tick, draw, tick, draw. Ju just like before, whenever Oliver hears tick, he's going to update the world. He's going to add 10. So that's still happening, right? But now we've got Henry. Henry's going to draw a circle, and it's always going to be somewhere on this line. It'll be right in the middle of the screen. But its x-coordinate for like where he, where he draws it is going to be whatever the world is. Tick. <laughs> okay. What if this was happening really, really fast? What would it look like on the screen? It'd go like this. Yeah. Yeah, it'll go from left to right. Tomorrow, we're going to start off making this ball fly around the screen. It's a little overwhelming the first day. Yeah. But do not worry. You're going to get through this. You're going to have an awesome game. So we made it to Friday. They're really excited about their game. So we decided to go out and get you some shirts. Woo! And wear it proudly, because you will have officially finished your own game. Melody. Yeah. Okay, so what happens to your world structure? When someone gets stabbed, what changes in your world? The health goes down. Good. What happens when you hit the jump? Speed goes down. What happens when you hit the car? Game over. You're going to be the runner, stand up, and you're going to be the obstacle. Um, we're going to act out your code. So you're going to start walking this way, and you're going to start walking this way. If you two touch each other according to their code, do you move? Oh, tough. Freeze. That's exactly what's happening in your game. We want to answer this question. Is the player Y above 370? So what, what code do you write for that? Good. Yeah. Go for it. He's in the air, like above 370. When what is above? Greater than 370. When what is greater than 370? The player. Player Y. Like, what are you going to refer? We have a Western-style game where the sheriff is trying to shoot the bandit before the bandit can stab him. 
they have little life meters that, that shrink as time goes by. Double jump! It's like a quadruple jump! One car can shoot, the other car can't shoot, but it can go faster. Oh, got you! We have a game about a monkey in a jungle trying to, to eat every banana he can find. We have a running game, where there's a racing game where two cars are, are racing. You know, now the kids are writing, you know, 200, 300 lines of code. It's all be good. So, congratulations. Give yourselves a round of applause. You just made your own games. <laughs> now, so I want to give you the opportunity both to show off your games to each other and to ask each other questions about the code that you wrote. This is basically going to be a chance for you to see how you wrote each other's code and to practice teaching someone about your code. Because at 3.30, which some of the computer science professors at Northeastern, as well as some of the people that I work with, as well as the guy who built Whiskey, are going to be here to see your work, and they're going to ask you questions about your code. Um, it's, it's kind of like more to code back, one trying to code the other. Can you explain what this function is all about? What does that do? The or means that either if the enemy kills the hero, or the hero kills the enemy, the health goes to zero or the health goes to zero. Very nice, guys. No, wait, that, no, that was gonna, you started shooting before I even think. The name of our game is Space Monkey. Basically, we have two cars. How come we don't have a monkey X? Because the monkey just goes on a Y axis in the same spot, um, in the same X coordinate, so it doesn't move left to right. It just reappears, and if car one gets hit by the monkey, it's game over. Mara, you be player two, which is arrow keys. I took this class three years ago, and I made a game called Forest Racer. I had a theme song and everything. So it's called Forest Racer, Forest Racer. No. <laughs> what I do at Google is that I'm a field tech, and I troubleshoot hardware and software. Coming here was probably like the first time I even like touched programming. Okay, 19 years old. Intern at Google and a pretty good IT guy. <laughs>